This morning, hello, I'm a little hot in this mic or this mic, not sure which one. But uh, this morning, we are um, continuing and even wrapping up a two-week sermon series on spiritual wellness. And just a very quick recap for those of you who are just kind of jumping into the message today. Last week, we started with some questions that center around this kind of questioning. Number one, how do you know if you are as spiritually healthy and strong as you can be? And number two, how can you know where you are weak in the area of your spirituality? Number three, we looked at what can you do to cultivate spiritual wellness in your life? These are very important questions for us to answer, and this is why we decided to delve into this topic called spiritual wellness. So, we started our spiritual wellness journey last week by completing a spiritual quote-unquote checkup to see where we're at. Wellness always begins with a checkup. Why? So that we can identify where the problems are or what the problems are and then figure out a treatment plan, if you will. A solution to get us back on track health-wise. We checked three things last week. We checked our sight, our hearing, and our taste in our checkup last week. And the first thing we talked about is sight, and we said that there are people who have 20-20 vision in the physical, but they are blind to the things of the spiritual realm. And that's the truth. For example, sometimes people lose sight of their relationship with God or they set their sights on things that do not draw them closer to God, instead draw them away from God. And so they're blinded spiritually. Things like worldly uh, success, fame, money, power, selfish ambitions, when we use these things for evil or not for good are when we lose sight uh, of what God wants for us. 1 John 2.16 says, For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. We talked about how if you and I are not careful, we can even sin with our sight. Like pornography, that's the lusting that we just talked about in the scripture we just read. And then we looked at this very hard scripture that Jesus says in Mark 9, 47, and it says this, And if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. It is better to enter the kingdom of God with only one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell. Now, Please do not go and gouge out your eyes. But please do take to heart what Jesus is trying to tell you when it concerns your spiritual sight. He's saying, guard your eyes. Take care of your eyes. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you do and what you see. That's what he's trying to do that. Why? Because when we keep our eyes pure and we focus our eyes on Christ, that's when we have spiritual wellness inside our soul. We talked about hearing, and we talked about Matthew 13, 12, where Jesus says that there are those who listen to my teaching, and when they do listen to my teaching, more understanding will be given to them, and they will have an abundance of knowledge. But for those who are not listening, then little, a little understanding that they have will be taken from them. Because he says they look but they can't really see. And they hear, but they don't really listen and understand. So any spiritual wellness or any kind of healing that needs to take place inside of us has to begin with spiritual eyes to see and spiritual hearing to hear what the Lord Jesus is trying to tell us. I talked about Proverbs 20, 12 that says, ears to hear and eyes to see, both are a gift from the Lord. Are you using those gifts? They're a gift from Jesus. 
We also talked about how our spiritual nourishment happens when we come to Jesus to receive that spiritual nourishment. Why? Because he is the bread of life. And that bread satisfies our spiritual hunger when we're hungry. And he also gives us rivers, rivers of living water to quench and satisfy our thirst. That living water hydrates and cleanses our soul. And that's why we need to come to him for those things. We've got to get into the presence of Jesus to receive those things. Because if we're disconnected from Jesus, then we cannot obtain the spiritual nourishment that we need when we're disconnected from him. And then our souls will barely be surviving. And that's not what he wants. And so if you want to know more about what we talked about in the supporting scriptures, you can find the sermon and download it on our Facebook page. Or remember that you have your Real Hope Church app, and the, the sermon is in there along with all the notes that you can download if you want to. So this week, this is what we're ending with. We are talking about three things today, and we're going to move pretty quickly, so you need to keep up. The first thing is we're going to talk about spiritual heart health. Heart health. Then we're going to talk about spiritual strength training so that we can strengthen our core, which is our faith, and the endurance. And the last thing we're going to talk about is spiritual mental health. That's what we're going to talk about. So let's dig right in. The first one is this, spiritual heart health. What is the most dangerous thing that can happen to your heart? It could stop beating, right? If it stops beating, blood stops flowing through the rest of your body and results in death, right? We all know that. We all have seen people that just will be eating one second, fall over dead in the next, right? It happens. But on a spiritual level, if your heart stops beating for Jesus, you're, you're basically toast spiritually. That you're toast spiritually because then you are in death if it stops beating for your creator, Jesus, and so we need to think about that. And just like it's important for you and I to take care of our heart health, our coronary wellness, if you will, the same is true about your spiritual heart. We've got to take care of it. Why is that? Look at Proverbs 4.23. It says this, guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life life. It determines where you're going to start. It determines where you're going to stop and every single path along the journey of life. We must guard our hearts in Christ Jesus. So how do we do that? How do we get a strong heart spiritually, right? Well, let's look at Ephesians 3, 17. I've got it for you on the screen. It says this. This is a clue that tells us how. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you, what? Trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you, what? Strong. Hold on to this picture of, the, of your roots growing down into Christ because we're going to pick that up probably in just a little bit. But a strong heart begins for you and for me when we allow Christ to make his home in our hearts. Can you pray this prayer? Lord, come and make my heart your home. Is that something you're willing to give to the Lord this morning? Can you welcome Jesus into your heart with more than your words? Can you welcome him into your heart with action, with the things you do, when you surrender your hearts to him, and when you tell him, Jesus, I have decided to put my trust in you. You can have my heart. Take the damaged parts of my heart, the clogged arteries, whatever's, not, whatever's stopping the, your blood, the blood of Jesus, from flowing, in me, take that, heal it, and make me whole. So we can get back on our spiritual heart health track by giving our hearts to Jesus and allowing him to come and bring the blood of Jesus to bring us life. That's what he wants to do. The second thing is this. 
We'll be, strength, we'll be strengthened spiritually for our wellness if we build, we're building our core strength, training, and endurance. Just as you and I experience weakness in our bodies, uh, we can experience weakness in our spirituality. That can happen to us. And believe me, there will be times when you do feel weak in the faith because of how hard things get in life. And when those hard challenges and those hard trials come your way, the question you have to ask yourself is, is my spirit, can my spirit remain strong and faithful even underneath all these pressures of life? Can you do that? Let's look at Romans 5, 3, and 4. It says, we can rejoice. Hold on to that word, rejoice. We can rejoice, too, when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they help us to develop endurance, and endurance develops our strength of character, and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. So if we were to take this verse and put this verse into like a formula, if you will, I'm not a mathematical person, but if we were to put it into the formula, it would look something like this. We have problems and trials, which equals development of endurance, which equals endurance that develops our strength of character, and character is what strengthens our confidence, our hope, and salvation. This is the formula. So did you know that problems and trials, as inconvenient as they are in our lives, as scary as they might be in our lives, as painful as they may be in our life, did you know that they serve you a great purpose in helping you to build your spiritual core? Let me tell you something. If you, as a follower of Christ, get this, you're going to be great. It's going to take you real, real far. Did you know that your problems, your trials, your challenges are spiritual strength training for you in the faith? And they lead you to it to develop your spiritual endurance. And so here's what I want you to know. The way you can build your spiritual core is to grow through the problems and trials that you go through. Grow through the problems and trials that you go through. Look at James 1, 2 through 4. It says, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind, big, small, rock your world, not rock your world, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. There's that word joy again that's connected to troubles and trials. That's crazy. But it says, when they come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow, for when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. Here's the thing. Too many Christians, let this not be you, but too many Christians check out when the going gets tough. And the tough will get going. Why? Because they lack the strength to endure. And worse than that, they lack the strength to endure with joy. If you get that, it'll take you far in your Christian walk. If you get that, it'll take you far. So, I want to encourage you as your pastor to check up on the level of your spiritual endurance. And so, if I asked you, what is the level of your spiritual endurance? You can take a problem and say, I can think of a problem right now that I'm going through right now. It's really tough. It keeps me awake at night. It's really big. And I'm going to ask you, okay, take that problem, put it in your head, see it in your eyes, see it in your mind, and tell me what's your endurance level in that problem. Between a one and a five, one being a low, five being the highest, 
Is your endurance level in this problem a one? Is your endurance level a three? Is it a five? What is your endurance level when you find yourself in a hard place? That's the thing. Are we allowing our spiritual endurance to grow and become fully developed during the trials that we experience? We need to. Because if you want to be spiritually well and healthy and strong, if you can do this, you will be. No doubt about it, you will be. It'll happen. Now, when we are building our muscles for our body, I'm not a body, lift weight lifter or anything like that. But when you, let you do that, you have to lift weights, right? And heavy ones, right? Or you have to do resistance training, right? You do this resistance training. Josh and Debbie know what I'm talking about because they see people every day doing it. Right, they're doing this. Resistance training. And so when you do this, your muscles are weak and you're trying to build them by exerting force and you're putting them through rigorous training. And sometimes when you're doing that, if you're working a muscle that is just either very, very weak or it's even atrophied, right? And you're working that muscle, what happens? Like, you, you start to shake, right? You're like, oh! And then, and then all of a sudden, you, like, you start to breathe a little bit. <sighs> Man, <sighs> you know, this is getting hard, right? And what happens after you've been working out a weak muscle, right? What happens, like, after that? You're sore, right? It hurts. You're like, ah, oh, sit down, ah. Oh. You know, you hurt. And you might be sore for, like, two or three days, however, afterwards when you're trying to really work those muscles and here's what I want to say about that when we are building our spiritual endurance and our core and our muscles it is not a pleasant feeling it doesn't feel good but it's necessary and the benefits will outweigh how bad it feels the benefit will outweigh the discomfort if we just but keep at it and before you know it you're building your spiritual muscles and it doesn't hurt so much anymore. And you can probably even take on more weight. Not that you would want to, but, well, those who are building muscle do want to. You can take on more weight. And so we've got to let the troubles that you and I go through, right now take the troubles and let them be your spiritual training to develop your endurance. And that you can endure through those troubles with joy. Not just get through them and endure but with joy. I trust you, God. This is tough, but I'm going to keep my eyes on you. I'm going to stay joyful, and I'm going to keep working this out, and I know you're going to use it all for your glory. Now, that's next level living. That's next level living. So let's do that. The third thing is this, mental health. I believe that the enemy attacks us at the mind more than probably anything he does. He goes straight for the mind. Because he knows what goes in here will eventually make its way down to here, which will definitely make its way out to here. So he starts here. He starts in your mind. And I believe that a spiritually strong mental health mind is one of the single greatest things that you can work to cultivate. I believe that a strong mind is one of the greatest things that you can nurture and build up. You got to put time into a healthy mind. I didn't mean for that to rhyme. I didn't mean for that to rhyme. You know what I mean? You got to build a healthy mind. Because if you don't, the enemy is going to take it. Take it. Take it. Unless you take it back. This is my mind. I'm going to take control of this mind. The Bible has a lot of help for us in this, me in this level, in this thing of mind. But what are some things that cause mental breakdowns in life? What are some of the triggers and the pressures that become too heavy for you and too heavy for me to bear? Those mind things that keep us awake at night, those mind things that really come to perturb us, what are those things? I want you to look at this with me. This is mental health, and it says everyone is fighting an invisible battle. Would you believe that? Yes. And under that, these things under that are what I call the culprits of chaos in your mind. 
So let's look at some of these culprits of chaos. Some of those are guilt, shame, neglect, hopelessness, helplessness, isolation, trauma, discrimination, and then I've added more insecurities, fear, depression, suicidal ideation, abandonment, and rejection. And even those are just a few. I didn't name them all. It's a long list of things we could be battling in our mind every single day. And if you battle those things in your mind every single day and for many hours a day, that's mentally exhausting. It's mentally too much. And you better believe that the enemy wants to keep you there. I want you to keep mulling over all these things, all these culprits of chaos in your mind. That's where I want you hanging out. That's what he wants. You can't give him that. And before I say anything else about mental health or spiritual mental health, let me say this. I want to encourage you as your pastor, as I should, that if you are battling really tough mental feelings or thoughts, seek a professional Christian, godly counselor. And especially if you are suffering with severe depression and it's debilitating for you and your relationships are being ruined because of your depression or if you have thoughts of ending it all, please seek help because the help is out there. And you might say, no, 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 I'm not going to seek help. I can do this. Really, if you could have done this, you would have done it. If you, could have, if you were powerful enough to do it, it would have been done. But it's not. Sometimes you need help from the outside. Get it. Get the godly help that you need. That's what I want to say. Because here's what the enemy doesn't want you and me to know. And listen well. He doesn't want you to know that you are God's most prized and precious creation. How do I know that? Because he decided to create you and me in his image. He didn't make you a donkey. He didn't make you something else. He made you in his image. That's how important you are to him. And don't you dare let the enemy tell you something different because he'll try. He sure is going to try. And so God, in his love and his kindness, knows and he feels that you are worth it all to have wholeness and to have healing of the mind and of the heart and of the spirit. You are worth that. That's what God wants you to know. The question is this, how badly do you want to be made whole? I know a lot of people who need a lot of help. But I guess not bad enough. I guess not bad enough. How bad do you want to be whole? How much do you long to be healed and set free from the, chaos, the culprits of chaos in your mind? Romans 8, 6, look at what it says. It says, for to set the mind on the flesh is death. But to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. When you are suffering with mental health issues, it is peace that you want. It is life that you're after. And it's available. It's available. How different would your and my mental state be if we intentionally set our minds on the power of the spirit of the living God instead of giving the culprits of chaos free reign in our mind? Guard your mind. Guard your mind. So according to the scripture, it's up to you and me to set our minds on the thoughts that bring life and peace. And the thoughts that come from the flesh lead us around a, a, a dark path. So in closing, Philippians 4, 8 says this, fix your thoughts. Fix your thoughts. Fix your thoughts. 
Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. So here's what I say from the two scriptures we just read. To set our minds and to fix our thoughts, that's something that you and I have to do. Somebody else is not going to fix your thoughts. Somebody else is not going to set your mind. That's the part you play. You do what you can do. You bring it to God. And what you can't do, you give it to him, and he'll take it from there. I'll do the rest. Set your minds on Christ. Fix your thoughts for mental wellness, spiritual mental wellness. May you and I do everything it takes to live a life of spiritual wellness before our King so that we can be healthy, happy, and we can take the light of Jesus to the world. That's what spiritual wellness is all about. Let us pray. Our gracious Redeemer and Savior, help us. Oh God, we need your help. We need your help to, to just uh, make a decision within our spirit to set our minds on Christ, to fix our thoughts on you and think about those things that are lovely and pure and honorable to you, Father. We give our spirituality, all of who we are to you. Make us what you would have us to be, for we are relying on you for every step we take along this spiritual wellness journey. Have your way, we pray, in your most holy, mighty, and matchless name, the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I want to sing this song. You say you might know it.